We are live here with SCI TV. I'm Joshua Gordon, the founder of the Sports Conflict Institute. Today I'm quite honored to have Dr. Gary Namey joining us. Welcome. Thank you, Josh. Thanks. So I'm, I'm ex extremely happy to have you on because more and more in the field that I operate in, which is the sporting world, and in particular college and professional sports, we keep seeing behavior and, and issues that come up that really invoke your area of expertise, which is bullying in the workplace. And so uh, I'm really looking forward to your insights here. I want to start off, for one, giving a little background, if you could, about how you got into this space. Obviously, you've written a number of texts on this, and, and to me, you are the expert out there on this as well. So maybe a little background, then we'll go right into our conversation at that point. Got into it involuntarily, without a doubt. It happened to my wife, as with, hadn't thought of that. Don't, don't worry about phones happen, we're live. Yeah, 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 they happen, they're handled. And it's totally by accident and uninvited, and it was a woman against my wife in a psychiatry clinic, and we didn't know what the heck hit us. It was a thunderbolt, really, that just rocked the family. We, at great expense, learned a very important lesson that it was not illegal. So this same gender harassment is very problematic with respect to the law, and we didn't know about it, but we had see the problem was we called it harassment. After her situation was resolved, we saw the British term workplace bullying, discovered it, stumbled upon it. That's my favorite verb for the Internet. It's how everybody finds us, stumbled upon. And uh, does no one go directly anywhere, but anyway, stumbled upon. And the... Uh, its origin, its originating term, uh, actually was mobbing. And when Ruth and I thought we would help a, um, an American organization, we said, well, who's doing this work? This is America. Certainly it's being done here. That was in 97 when we made the commitment. And lo and behold, it wasn't. So we became then the first, and we remain the only organization that's dedicated to workplace bullying that's Got, combines the research and the public education and the books and the videos and the expert witness and all the yada yada and and the consulting for employers as well as trying to advance the law. So that was 17 years ago June so we just passed that month of our anniversary and it's what my wife and I have dedicated our lives to ever since. And from my perspective it, it sure seems like the last five years or so this has really entered the, the forethought of most people. And now the media hops on stories of bullying in a way that I don't imagine was happening when you first started this in the late 90s. It, it, oh, Josh, from your lips to... <laughs> uh, I, okay, maybe five years, yeah. We had a big surge in 2000 when, and here's... We intersected with your arena early. And we had just really got the ball rolling. Oprah and had called and everything in 98. It was a big year for us. Then in 2000, the first edition of our book, Bully at Work, came out. Right, right at the month of the release was when uh, Indiana, you finally decided to take action against Bobby Knight. And, and they canned him. And boy, oh boy, I just did a lot of sports talk radio throughout Indiana, and I took a beating. You calling our hero, our god, a, uh, uh, a bully. And, uh, you know, it's been tough. That, that was an incredible book launch in, in that sense. But I, I think you're right. The next wave, really, the unprecedented wave, has been uh, also sports related. So in a way, that's what elevates it in the consciousness for America. I swear, without sports, I don't think they see it. Yeah, so we, the Indiana examples are a fantastic one. One of the folks I worked closely with in the last few years was Peg Brand, and she's the wife of the late Miles Brand, who actually was the, the president who was in charge of the university during that firing. And they tell stories of, you know, clearly there was a, a path of bullying. I, I don't think anyone can look back at that now and say there wasn't. And yet the president and his wife were the ones facing bomb threats and death threats in their house. Well, they get death threats. They actually got death threats. Right. R really astonishing. And, and we were working with a large university recently on a similar issue. And actually there was folks who had been there during Bobby Knight's firing at Indiana. 
and they're having flashbacks because here we are this many years later and there's still the very same challenges in, in intercollegiate sports and certainly professional sports as well. Now that speaks also to a parallel that happens in corporate and that is it really takes a new leader to come in to break the old tradition because the the well-established historical bully has such a reward history and when somebody comes in and, and, and who they know already and says we're ready to unseat you we've had it with you we're fed up they say you know what you've tried to take me down before you're a loser I can take care of this and I will show you I will take you out and it is amazing it takes a breath of fresh air someone else who comes in and says what's this nonsense I do expert witness work, and this is this happens with long-established, fully tenured professors who are absolutely tyrannical, and it not until a new administration comes in with new strength, if you will, the excuse. So what that says to me, and you tell me, is we're never. It's so hard to purge these people who are so destructive if you actually have a history of yielding to them before and rolling over and cowering, right? I mean, I mean, if they're sports gods. Yeah, in the, in the sporting world, there are a few factors that I would suspect contribute to that even further. So one, the highest paid state employee in just about any state is going to be your head football coach for the major D1 programs. So they, they yield tremendous power financially and otherwise. They have backers who care passionately about them even if they themselves never had any relationship with the university and they bring in tremendous revenue to the university that make them critical even if we may not agree that that should be the mission of a university it has become an important part of every university right that's true they're seen as the rainmakers though the ones that generate all this revenue for the campus and they are but that's just like in a law firm the one who brings in the highest profile cases becomes untouchable. We have this idea that we, and, and it's true of athletes too, the more I keep thinking about it, the more I'm talking myself into it, but it's so obvious that with the money comes the level of power that make allows them to deal out this, this misery with impunity. I don't know what it is about our society that refuses to hold accountable these super wealthy. It's just amazing. So let, let's go back to basics for a moment, Gary. Uh, hmm. A lot of people in our audience, they know the word bullying, but they don't truly have a grasp of what is and what isn't bullying. So can we, can we establish some of that from your, from your perspective, and then let's put it into context in the sporting world as well? Yeah, and I do want to make that important distinction because even judges will say, oh, I know bullying, I know bullying, but that's just some superficial knowledge of it. Bullying for us in the adult world, in the, work, in the adult workplace, which we think is also a sports arena, but we'll talk about that, is repeated health-harming mistreatment by one or more people that takes the form of verbal abuse, intimidation, sabotage, humiliation, threats, or verbal abuse. I already said verbal abuse. But the point being, it is a form of abusive conduct very much akin to domestic violence. So it is not simply teasing, taunting, or some of the, um, well, they sound like lesser offensives. I don't mean to minimize it, that for the younger people, but uh, truth be told, um, bullying is a wide range of uh, misconduct. But for us, it is a form of workplace violence that stops just short of the physical, just short of battery. And it's that severe because of its consequences. So I, I want to elevate it beyond, quote, bullying to, see, to be perceived as abuse. Then we have a whole different class for that. We understand abusers and, uh, and the abused. And I think that's where it should, should dwell. And so one of the challenges I imagine with, with sports is that we're, we often are preaching toughness in sports and that coaches who have their own prerogative to have their space to really challenge and push their athletes to, to really achieve more, that sports are not easy, that they require tremendous dedication and commitment in order to do well, and the physical demands aren't for the lighthearted. And it seems to contribute to the idea that if you aren't tough enough, 
you're not going to be successful. And then wrapped into this is all this other behavior you're identifying that seems to be people's perception of how you demonstrate toughness. How, how do we differentiate from yeah. the true and genuine toughness that's needed to be an athlete and this line that gets crossed to something that is more like violence or abuse you know, that, that we're calling bullying? The first, well, that distinction I make all the time for corporate distinction between a tough boss and an abusive boss, and that is when the consequences are uh, either undermining the mission, the very purpose of the enterprise, but also and must. It's not. It is absolutely it could be standalone. It must include health harm of the individual, the recipient. Then it is beyond the pale, and nothing justifies it. I got quite a lesson working with Jonathan Martin in his Miami Dolphins quote bullying scandal and all that. But I actually learned a lot from Richard Sherman's one of his many um, articulate, astute analyses after he had his post 49er game explosion in the playoffs. Remember, and he runs off the field and he scares Aaron Andrews. I don't, I don't think he did scare her, but. It scared a lot of white people, that's for sure, around the country. And they said, oh, my gosh, he's this and he's that. And I, I, I captured a clip from him on CNN in which he described perfectly what you're talking about. He said the football field is, well, football is a barbaric sport, but the barbarism needs to stay out there between the lines. And he said, I dare not bring that into the locker room or take it off the field, and I'm sorry that you saw me in that heat of the moment of being barbaric, I'm not that person outside the field. It really is role governed in that regard. And that Sherman switch is something that I don't think every athlete can actually accomplish. But I think the best coaches teach it. When you're talking about coaches that abuse coaching prerogative, just like managers abuse managerial prerogative, it's they. I don't think they have a switch. I don't think they understand the difference between competing for market share to make your company the best to do this and to do that and then how you act in the locker room and how you act when you're back in back in the corporate office and you're not fighting in the market you cannot destroy one another and still be competitive you can't and and I think a lot of sports coaches have forgotten reinforcement principles 101 you got to emphasize the positive or you're just going to destroy a person. Aversive conditioning and it is not a good motivational tactic. In the corporate world, Jack Welch's model dominates. I was just working with a union. I was just training a union this past weekend and Verizon is the corporation and their whole point is they adopted the Jack Welch model of 10 percent of you get fired regardless regardless of performance because I need to scare the hell out of everyone else to quote motivate them. Well if that would be a coaching philosophy that the only time I'm here to catch you is when you fail or and or I'm going to manufacture a lie that you actually have failed when you have not, well that's disingenuous, lacks integrity. How can you how could you build a sports team on that? This must be unnerving to you when you see these stories. You tell me. Oh, it, it's horribly unnerving, and you imagine, especially at the collegiate level, I, I have a different sensitivity towards it because what you have is young student athletes who are there ostensibly for an education that includes their athletic programming, and they are treated in a way that you would never want your son or daughter treated. And this is not across the board. Of course, there are great experiences, but we see enough of these stories, whether it's what happened at Rutgers or Oregon State, and, and actually, there's little pockets. It seems like women's basketball is one of these pockets that has a lot of this behavior, but they, they go across the board in, in different sports. I, I have a little more tolerance in the professional level, not excusing it, but it, it certainly is, at least when you're talking about potentially millionaires, you, you have some level playing field, although I, I suspect you'll tell me that there's, there's quite a bit going on there with the coaching dynamic that, that's at play as well. But let, let's focus for a moment on the college level. What, why... Yes. Why, from your perspective, are there so many coaches that are missing the boat when it comes to these motivational profiles and how to get something out of their, their student-athletes? I, I think it parallels history and management. 
if that's if they've never learned how to do differently and yet they have been told you're wonderful you're wonderful you're wonderful we love your results and now they're middle-aged who's going to change them the point is they've got they are to me they're stuck in a rut they're dinosaurs uh, but the point is they've had all the external rewards they've ever they've ever that anyone could could hope to achieve and and then everyone else becomes their their apologist it is a mate like with Bobby Knight oh this whole rot about oh he's got great graduation rates and he's this and he's that so he chokes a player or not had there not been a video he'd still be in Indiana it's without the video nothing nothing hardly would have changed I don't know maybe that's not true because you know from the inside but I will tell you on the non sports arena he should have been fired because he violated the university's violence policies constantly he choked admin assistants he choked secretaries he threatened people who would get between him and the athletic directors he kept getting fired it's amazing a normal employee couldn't have done that but we grant these people impunity but I'm just saying I don't know why they so many people are allowed to coach and they never learn to coach from the beginning I've been a, I was 21 years college professor and I know when you're in the people development business although it wasn't sports but I was in the people development business you try and find potential and you try and encourage it and I <clears throat> taught technical writing to people and it's a hard skill and you bring them along but you don't club them to death along the way I don't understand why in this country okay I have two theories one is our obsession with personal responsibility of other people never ourselves so the coach who will hold the player personally responsible and blame so it's blame focused so that that's clearly one of them and I just think that and this other thing this this maxim that is part of current society I don't understand don't explain nobody wants to hear explanations they say you're if you're an explainer you're an excuse maker so and I, I would imagine you tell me I would imagine that's in the toolkit for bad coaches but I don't understand that explanations are how we learn and how we show nuance so what I'm seeing is a loss of respect for nuanced behavior. People wanted black and white. We're back. We're going. We're going Neanderthal. We're going into concrete thinking only. I don't know. What do you think? I can't yeah. stand this. Don't explain. So there, there's this concept called the sport ethic, and the sport ethic has a different set of you know, principles that we ascribe to our athletes about what we expect of them than we would in any other setting. Yeah, the example would be in the sporting world, it's not uncommon for someone to, to lose an important family member, right? You, you, you have your mother dies or your sister dies or someone like that. And our expectation is that they will be there for the very next game. And the fan base will be upset if they're not. The coaches will often be upset if they're not. And yeah, I, I imagine that in any other setting, if I were to require one of my students to show up the day after their mother passed away, I would be rightfully seen as a barbarian and yet that is not how it's seen in fact it's turned back on the athlete to say they're not really committed they don't care about winning when hmm. they have something else going on and and to me the sport ethic has been passed around from passed down from generation to generation and the coaches have come from this school of thought they they've learned not in classrooms not learning you know by reading your book but they've learned by going through that school of hard knocks themselves surviving it and then thinking that that's the key to how you do it, right? And it, these mythologies get perpetuated more from a hand-me-down perspective than from any great learning or great research. You know, that takes me to hazing. The whole idea is part of the sport ethic, too, that must be how rookies are treated in any team and this and that, and then disregarded and, and disrespected sort of broadly. But I remember the thing that I learned at, that uh, Jonathan Martin told me was, see, that's how he got in trouble, by the way. He never learned to disrespect rookies because Harbaugh's whole line was, during his college years, is you never know if that walk-on rookie is going to be your superstar next season. 
So you will not mistreat and denigrate and belittle the newbie. You will not do this and that. In many, many industries, that's exactly what it is. So it's fraternity hazing. Now, I had occasion to be sports and military are very common. I think they, there's a great deal of overlap. And I was speaking at West Point, introducing them to bullying. And they, the reason I was invited was they also, I needed to hear how the military was committed to ending hazing. Here they had gone along in these programs and invested sometimes a quarter million to half million dollars in specialty training for some of these individuals over many, many years, and they're killed at the graduation ceremony, Josh, for crying out loud, with a baseball bat or the uh, the pinning, I forget what it's called, um, where they pound the, uh, the uh, pins on you and... Uh, you know, basically you could bleed to death. So long story short, the military has said no to hazing, and they're very interested in stopping bullying. Now that's totally a gray area. But in the sports world, I don't see an end to the hazing. I, I don't, I, I think if anything, they should look to the military and say, okay, let's talk about what real tough is. <laughs> and uh, actually, by teaching the military officers years ago when I was teaching manager and graduate management taught me a lot and they were the best managers I had found ever civilian managers who act like they're in the military little martinets and tyrannical puppets that kind of a thing but were not ever really in the military and are not now need to remember that the military arms their subordinates and would if you're a true leader you ought to be able to turn your back I think the sports world ought to start, and I know this is crazy, but I don't know what lessons there are to learn, and you should get a guest on about the military, because there's a nexus for you, too, unless you have, you've probably already done it. But if not, that'd be a good show down the road, because I think sports world should be informed by people tougher than they themselves, so that they, they, so they understand the language, and it's not about weakness. And so... I mean, I think we, we're both on the same page that this is a per pervasive problem in sports. And I think maybe we would get some pushback out there, but I, frankly, a lot of athletic directors and other folks acknowledge that there's a problem out there. And for them, they're struggling to figure out how do you identify it or how do you figure out where the risk factors are to know that that's going to be happening. So if, if you were to have a conversation with an athletic director, you try and highlight for them, here are the things that would put you at a greater risk of having a bullying coach under your umbrella, what would be some of those risk factors that we'd want to highlight for an athletic director to make sure that they're aware that they may be in a risky program with the way they're structuring their department? First thing I look to is senior most leadership. Where's What's the level of engagement? We know from all the research that laissez-faire at the top is, the, is probably the most enabling factor of all. Two, as a disregard for employee, or in this case, athletes' uh, health and well-being, because uh, if they're going to mock them for wanting to play concussion-free or, or uh, shame them should they be depressed and seek help or the, you know, try to just totally stigmatize them for anything that would be psychological, I think that, that, you're, that, that it's problematic. Then you look at what is the uh, structure of the internal within the player within team policing and one of the things that happened in the Martin case was outsiders foolishly said why didn't Jonathan Martin turn to the team's leadership council because it was chaired by and dominated by Richie Incognito uh, his one of his main persecutors he had three the public didn't know about the other two for a good while until the report came out. Everybody thought it was just incognito, but he was actually uh, under the thumb of three who decided to tag him. So if you have a bogus, insincere way of players resolving disputes among themselves, I think it's problematic. So I'd look at those three things as potential risk factors, and then I would say, I want to ask you about it. You're the conflict resolution guru, uh, and I am not, and that is, I think you need a structured set of protocols that anybody can use 
that is independent of who the personalities of the player are. For me, it's the work environment. It's uh, and, and so is there has there been declared an unacceptability by the coaches of this kind of treatment? Well, as you said, if the coaches are the main perpetrator, well, that's a check mark that will never be made. But even if the coaches do declare they have an espoused value, they stated it and they print it up and it's around the locker room, do they walk the room enough to make sure that it's enforced? And, and sure enough, if they are an absent coach and they let players work it out between themselves, I think some of the baser instincts will make it a pretty self-destructive place. What have you found? You know, you highlight a number of things that I think are, are spot on. One being that, in, especially in collegiate athletics and, and also professional for that, that matter, they rely on other athletes enforcing rules and creating rules. So decidedly pushing that responsibility out to often 18 to 22 year olds right, who have no background in, in doing this. So you, you have a, a leadership model of folks who have survived, been hazed themselves, been bullied, and then they are now in a leadership role and they only know one way and they're going to perpetuate it. So I think that's absolutely spot on. I think the issue of visibility is one we key in on a lot. That Athletes are often isolated. Uh, let's stay with the college campus example. Most college campuses, there are exceptions like Harvard University, for example, they house all of their student athletes together in isolation. They, they live together, they eat together, they often take classes together. The interaction isn't there where they're going to get that checkpoint from someone else saying, hey, you know what, that experience you're having every day is crazy, right? They, it, it is normal to them because it's exactly what they go through all the time. And it's, you know, what we would see as an outsider coming in going, that is insane, that that is expected of you on a daily basis. They lose sight of that because they are pulled away from the rest of the community. So if I, they had a dorm mate who saw that, they would be the ones that have felt free to say that's crazy. Right, and you look at those models. So we, we were talking with Bob Scalise at Harvard University recently, and he talked about Harvard makes a decision – not to house student athletes with other student athletes. For that very reason, they want to have someone who says, look, that's crazy what you're going through. Your coach is treating you poorly. Your teammate is treating you poorly. And, and, and that, they, if you look at them, they've not had a lot of these issues. Now, you, you could say that they have a different population and all that. I don't think that explains it. I actually think structurally they do things differently. And, and at any point in history, if we look at organizations that ghettoize their employees, those employees are at risk, right? They're vulnerable. Well, it's inbreed. It's an in-group, inbreeding um, uh, culture where it's incessant feedback loop where they get no correction. I mean, you're right. All it does is reinforce. It's an echo chamber where they just all say, "Yeah, yeah, 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 yeah. This is it. This is it," and it becomes their only world. It's scary. So no wonder so few. I don't you know. Maybe that's what affects graduation rates and everything else. Maybe they. I don't know. And the other thing, Gary, is that I think it's very hard to provide a safe space for, for student athletes to go to. We, we've been playing with this model of an ombuds concept where you have somebody who's not related to the team who, who builds trust and can go and at least informally guide someone through these tough periods that they go through. Uh, otherwise, who do you turn to? You turn to an assistant coach, they rat you out to the head coach, and then you're off the team for other reasons. Right, you're not suddenly you're not playing well enough, or, or frankly, if you're going through this, maybe you aren't playing well enough. I, I think in the Martin case, there could be an argument made that he, he wasn't playing well enough. But you, how do you play well enough when that's going on? He still had started all the games. Right. Yeah. And, so I mean, you know, objectively, he had that. But yes, yeah, agreed. And then the the institution has to. I think they have to be realistic about mental health when people are strained. Let me go farther back. Let me go back more abstractly. I think they have to be, they have to understand legitimate stressors and illegitimate ones, I think, and distress. The, the stress that comes from the athletic endeavor itself is something that they asked for and they like and they want and it can drive achievement. So that's you stress, right? EU stress. It's like riding the roller coaster that you seek excitement from. And it is the buzz, and it can be quite motivating. So when people say stress is motivating, okay, I'll give them that. 
Uh, we need a certain level of arousal to get up every day and get going and all that other stuff. But distress is never, never, and should never be construed ever, ever as positive. And distress is what triggers the human stress response. And you know what? It doesn't care if you're an athlete or a non-athlete, man or woman small or large and the rest and we in this society in general mock distress we feel that if people can't we, we somehow think we can will it away just by altering perceptions now okay there's some cognitive role clearly the stress es experts do tell us that there's a cognitive role to prevent reliving um, traumatic events and other things like that but truth be told the instantaneous spontaneous response is clear and honest and your body knows distress before your mind does and I don't uh, and so when people hurt they're not allowed to hurt period so having somebody to talk to uh, going back to your model with an ombuds not bad my problem with ombuds in organizations is their commitment to confidentiality not that I don't like the confidentiality. I like. I don't. I, I like the. I don't like the fact that they're. They're not. They're limited in action because of the confidentiality. In other words, even if they saw a fix, they can't go implement the fix without violating the confidentiality. So how do you want? How do you do that? How do you overcome that? They need more action. The right to act. Yeah, and and certainly there's some interplay between the formal and the informal. So ombuds operate on this informal basis, but we we absolutely need more in the formal side of it to give someone a clear path to put the organization on notice that this behavior is happening and that it's actionable. And if you don't take action, you've been put on notice and that begins the, the chain of response. Uh, right now, to, to put an organization on notice, I can't imagine very many student athletes or even professional athletes would know how to engage that process without the help of already escalating it to the point of an attorney. Right? That seems I to be agree. the first time they get someone to advocate for them, and you're really far along in a conflict at that point. And, and I think it's really important. See, and I want to know if you agree. One of the phrases we use all the time, and this is very technical, is the power of being listened to. <laughs> Just simply, when it's ambiguous and you don't know, the thing about bullying is because of its current legality, no states, and Massachusetts just um, ended July 31st, so that that's the last. We only have a couple states standing uh, now, New York and, well, New Jersey is a different two-year schedule, legislative. But we don't, so there's no outlawing of this. There's no legal standard for actionable abusive conduct in any workplace in America yet. So having said the fact that it's legal, Having said the fact that you're an adult and this is happening to you and you don't want to be infantilized and treated like a child, there's a great deal of shame in this. So it's not only ambiguous, but it's shameful and you don't you're not sure of what you're feeling. Just that's the nature of emotion. We know from emotion theory you pretty much have the arousal, you look around for others to for the cues to what to call this and in, if you're in a sports world and no one else is reacting to this, you are going to think, you, you must think you're the only one and you're isolated, you're not of course, and, and you're somewhat crazy. So that they do need somebody to work it out with. Short of a formal complaint, way short of that. Just like, am I, am I alone? Am I crazy? I mean, that's the service we provide at WBI for people from the workplace. But I think sports play, I think athletes need it. I think they really do. And they don't, you know, and they, somebody who would understand the process, we do it through, in corporations, expert peer teams. We train an internal team to provide that service, that function. But I don't know how we would do it in the sports world. We propose to the NFL, of course, uh, after the fact, uh, the Martin case, but interestingly there they chose to solve the problem by calling it, first they saw it as racial, so they took a diversity approach, which is if you mislabel the problem, your solution is not going to be complete. So, and then they had Anais Williams go around to every team and say, come on, I'm a respected guy, you can, 
you need to be respectful. One hour, a one hour lecture to the uh, to the uh, management of the teams before the players showed up at OTA. It's crazy. It, you got to do the you got to do the solution. Yeah, Gary, I I like a lot of people at the NFL, and I respect a lot of them and work with them closely. And I was astonished by the response after the one hour sessions. How, how do you change behavior for the one hour session? I always tell people in the sports world because we'll get calls asking for conflict training in an hour. You know, and yes. you must you must get the same thing. I say, well, how would you train a you know football player on a new offense? And they give me this elaborate response about how they would sketch it out, they'd study it, they'd practice it, reinforce it, give feedback, practice it, reinforce it, change their rules, <laughs> reinforce. It. I say, yeah, that's how we teach conflict skills. That's how we teach how to deal with bullying. You can't do a one-hour, one-off. And then the, the other part of the Miami response that I found really puzzling was the idea of putting almost a police state in the locker room. Um, my understanding was they, they had a CIA, a former CIA expert come in, help install cameras and some other things there to, to oh. that kind of visibility. And that just sounded like the wrong response to me as well. Yeah, it was the wrong response. This from a team that when Jonathan actually found the strength to leave, which is remarkable, um, and perhaps throw his whole career away and say, I would like some emotional help. They gave it, They sent him to this 80-year-old friend of the team who had him over for barbecues so his dog could, could go in the yard and, and have access to a grassy yard while they sat around and talked about life. Not Jonathan's life, not counseling, not clinical support, but rather just that that so I don't I don't know where these people are learning solutions you're absolutely right that means they don't value with the one hour they don't value anything about conflict they feel maybe they think health conflict is healthy well good conflict is somewhat healthy but not when it is conflict among different level peers people with different not peers different powered individuals because then it's it's so prone to these other kinds of disastrous consequences. When people suffer, and I just came uh, with it from another government agency, unnamed, where as a part of their work, they suffer PTSD coming back from war zones. They several people pulled me aside and told me I could deal with the war. Maybe I can't. I already have PTSD. But what really irks me is all of the political relationship crap that was heaped on top of the already tough war zone. So what we're talking about is bullying is a supplement to the physical exertion and the mental exertion of learning a game and stay and be trying to be a peak performing athlete and all the rest is garbage that has nothing to do with that attainment and that achievement. And yet we ask people to just absorb that and write it off as if that's routine course of events. And it needn't be. I don't know why we, uh, we do that. Are we fans doing this? I'm wondering. With our fandom, do we push these teams to these limits where coaches feel that they have to do this? And owners and the athletic departments? I don't know. What's your thing? Uh, certainly one of the areas of concern that I've expressed to, to folks in intercollegiate athletics is the, the idea that so quickly we've elevated student athletes into not feeling like your peers on campus, but rather an entertainer or someone who, who you can't identify with, and then we treat them differently. So we, we, you know, we've worked with some of the fan groups where they boo their fellow students when they miss a you know, free throw in basketball or, or something like that. Some of that's building a little empathy. All right, well... Imagine if you were going and doing a presentation in class and you stumbled a little bit, do you want to be booed? Right? Why, why does it have to – if you really want them to do well, why are you doing that behavior and, and looking at some of that? And, and a lot of the answers we were getting back was that they don't see them as a peer. They, they see them as a privileged group that they don't have any part of. And, and so some of that goes back to the idea of reintegration. And let, let, let me ask you, Gary, if you were to be given a, a new title – if we were to call you a czar of the NCAA or czar of the NFL, what, what would you prescribe some changes that need to happen in order to not have us having this conversation 15 years from now about, you know, look how bad it is, but nothing's changed, right, which is my, my fear. 
I, I would hate for us to be in this position years down the road that while we even create more awareness, we haven't created change because change is where it's exactly. at. Exactly. You know, if I ruled any corner of the sports world, I would, I would want this piece of it, this abuse of conduct, to be from from my office, the highest office, czarness that it would be, or whatever, to pass it down to basically say this will be deemed unacceptable, and hiring criteria of all the leaders will be based on it. And I think you would start to find a self-selection factor. You'd find a few, most people we find who are bullies in the workplace will change because that's, it's not a, a core aspect of the personality, rather they're just responding to the environment that says you have to be super aggressive to get ahead. So they're going to do that which gets rewarded, right? Simple as that. So they'll change. The psychopathic ones will not change. They will look for other outlets, other venues, but Here's the point. If you really have that kind of control, if you have Roger Goodell and Adam Silver type control, or what's his name at NCAA, Emmert? Mm -hmm. from, from your home. And you declare it. You declare it. We shall not allow, we're now, we're changing our whole values. And all that, let people rumble. Let the sports pundits, you know, pitch a fit and let the fans threaten a boycott but you will have plenty of winners. The movie coming out uh, in September about Latticher at um, De La Salle High School with the long, long winning. Well, I happened to live in Concord during those years, and it was pretty remarkable to see that. And there are other role models. We need to find them, and we need to revere them. Trouble is they live in the shadows too much. Um, uh, one, like you, you're opening. They're the, they're the highest paid people on campus. Well, as an old professor, I'm wondering what kind of value is that? What is that? Of course, then the whole NCAA's issues with student athlete and the problems with that and the criticisms. But why are you paying these people this kind of money? This is, it's obscene. So let's reverse the, re to me, what we try and do in the corporate culture, we reverse the reward structure. We don't say we're going to change the culture. We say we're going to reverse the rewards. That behavior, that craziness, that destructiveness of other human beings, which once brought you prowess and esteem and put you on a pedestal where you're revered, will now lead to you being mocked, and now you will be reviled instead of revered. If we could reverse that, but who could do that? Only someone at the super top. I don't know. It, it's interesting with changes of administration, what can be done at a single college level. Why couldn't it be done at a league level? I don't know. What's your dream? Do you think that, <laughs> I mean, I know you want these people to have conflict resolution skills as part of their arsenal so that it's in their toolkit and it, and it serves everybody well. Yeah, fr frankly, Gary, and I, I tell this to my peers in the conflict resolution field as well, I, long ago I stopped talking about doing the right thing. I, I don't think that's a powerful message for a lot of people, even though I, I can believe strongly that bullying is wrong and I can believe that you know there's all these other reasons to be a positive motivator and all that. Let's just talk about dollars and wins for a moment. Mm -hmm. but, uh, ultimately, I don't think bullying is good business. I think it costs you money, a lot of it. If you look at the cost of the lawsuits and investigations and you look at uh, how much of your staff time is then dedicated to, to following up and dealing with it and the loss of reputation for your institution, and then it costs you wins. If people aren't performing at their highest level, uh, any of, uh, any critical function, then you're, you're losing, right? You're not going to be winning as much as you should be. And so to me, I don't need people to buy into the soft side of it. I don't need them to care about it on a human level. And that's why I like so much about what you're talking about with rewards, that if we structure the contracts, we structure the system in, in a way that aligns it to the idea of, yeah, we do want you winning, and we do want you profitable, but that's not through bullying. It's got to be through some other way. And, and to me, that, that's why I find what you're saying so, so utterly compelling. And frankly, any athletic director or commissioner should hop right on this because they will differentiate themselves if they're willing to. Excellence without abuse. There's nowhere is it written that you have to be abusive to excel. 
And then you're right. I, in my talks, I end with a moral argument, but it really it, it deserves to be at the end to give closure for me. But it's not an appeal that that resonates. Corporate America doesn't really care about the cost, though we go to great lengths to explain how that how costly it is. Turnover, absenteeism, litigation, all of the rest. So if they're rational, we have the we have the, have a, an explanation in mind and a reason. I use employee health now. I think it's a, I think it's amazing that these and it's only through lawsuits too that they've come to care about concussions and injuries, injured players because they treat them like chattel. They they're dispensable and replaceable and they're just widgets anyway this this new NFL lawsuit about letting people play injured all that I mean that is that is so revelatory it says so much but um, the men who committed suicide and made a point to say please look at my brain uh, their sacrifice I don't think is uh, the public doesn't know what that took but it took tremendous courage to do all that um, I would like to see player health somehow be elevated and I don't I don't know if we can do that uh, because that ethic that you laid out is so callous and um, it just total disregard for the the ability of that person to continue to perform at the level we want they're not going to do it injured it's strange well, Gary, I'm a, I'm a big believer in education and knowledge, and as we wrap our conversation here, could you highlight for our guests some of the, the ways they can access some of your information that you've put out there over the past multiple decades? Uh, because I do think that, you know, I've read your books, and I, there's very prescriptive work in there that is incredibly helpful. I've handed it off to athletic directors, and they, they've done better afterwards. Uh, what, what would you want to highlight for our guests as well? Well, first, I think you're doing great work. I think you have taken on a task as difficult as Ruth and I have over the years. So you're, I admire you for doing that, Josh. So kudos to you. You can find our work at uh, a portal site, workplacebullying.org, for the Workplace Bullying Institute. And the footer of any page will direct you to the various other aspects of it. But from there, you should be able to navigate um, I'm especially proud of a fairly comprehensive YouTube site for those who are visually inclined and uh, go check it out. We have plenty of clips there teaching people about the phenomenon. We've got to take shame out of this and I think I know that's part of your mission too that the athlete who actually cares about having it done in a fair way um, uh, in a non-injurious way to be treated respectfully uh, they need to be re they need to be backed up and supported because they are they're like lone wolves out there. But they're not alone. Just like our bully targets, they're not alone. There are millions of others, and by you getting your message out, you're helping strengthen that for them. They're not alone, and they didn't cause this injury upon themselves. The abuse. Nobody invites it. So if we can get bust those couple of myths, we will have done great work. Well, thank, thank you so much for joining us. I'm incredibly appreciative, not just of you joining today, but also all of the work you've done. And uh, I don't think we'd be having this conversation in general if it weren't for you and your wife and the work you've done. And uh, I'm very appreciative, and I'll continue to be an admirer, and, and thank you very much. Thank you.